Good morning. All right, we're continuing with our series this morning on. Uh, all right, I didn't do that. <laughs> make the most of it, and this morning, uh, make the most of your Bible. I. I'm so glad to see all of you. I really felt like I missed out not being able to be here last week. And I know a lot of us have been uh, dealing with different kinds of sicknesses over the last couple of weeks. And it's good to see all of you uh, that have recovered. And I know we still have some people that are out uh, sick even uh, this morning. And so we want to remember to continue to pray for them. Do you remember when you received your first Bible? I remember I got mine back in 1980. In fact, that's a picture of it right there on the screen. The very first Bible, it was a uh, New American Standard Bible. And uh, since that time, up until about a year, a year and a half ago, that's what I have been uh, reading. You know, the Bible is a book that's unlike any other book. It's a book that's been written, written by over 40 people over a 1,500-year period. It is a book, in spite of its age, that has never gone out of print it is always a regular bestseller. Uh, there are more copies produced, ancient and new, than any other book in existence. It has been translated into nearly every language in the world. In fact, some written languages were created specifically, specifically for the purpose of being able to translate the Bible into that language. The Bible has never been destroyed. There have been people that have tried to destroy the book but never been able to. Uh, in fact, there are some people that make uh, their life's work to study the Bible in the original language that it was written in. Some people simply call it the book. And some people consider it their most precious possession. I remember back in the early 90s when we went into one of the uh, countries of the uh, former Soviet Union after the uh, Soviet Union broke apart, we brought a whole bunch of Russian language Bibles with us. And we gave them away, and for the people that got a hold of one of them, it was like it was the most precious thing that they had ever laid their hands on. In fact, I'm getting ready to show you a video in uh, China uh, that shows a drop-off of a bunch of supplies, including Chinese Bibles. And there were some people that walked 30 miles in order to get uh, their own personal copy of the Bible. Look at the reaction. She's saying, out of everything we received, this is what we needed the most. So what is so special about the Bible? It's the only book that's called the Word of God. And so, and it is a, a tremendous gift to be able to have this in our hands. And so we do want to make the most of our Bibles. And what I want to do this morning is look at some uh, analogies and metaphors of the Bible and, and what those uh, metaphors and analogies teach us about how we can make the most of our Bible and how to value it. And so uh, I want to start with the uh, first psalm this morning. Read the first paragraph of the, uh, of the first psalm. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither, whatever they do prospers. 
the Word of God. The Bible is like water. It's like water by a planted tree. And we live in an area where we're surrounded by fruit-bearing trees that come around every year. And we know that uh, those fruit-bearing trees and the fruit that we uh, receive from them, it doesn't happen by accident. There's a lot of work that goes into it. Those trees have been planted. Those trees have been cultivated. There's pruning and work and watering and caring and all the things that go along with uh, uh, taking care of uh, this tree. The image in this psalm is not of some wild tree that would just happen to sprout up on its own by some meandering, beautiful stream someplace. But it, it says it is a tree that's planted. It's a planted tree. It's a cultivated tree planted by irrigation canals. And with all of the care and the attention that goes into it, it finally bears fruit when the time comes. In this analogy, you and I are that tree planted by the water. And in order to bear fruit that brings all of the joy and the blessing that comes from the fruit, we need to be cultivated. How are we cultivated? Well, the psalm says, blessed is the one who does not walk in step of the wicked. We don't do that. We walk righteously. And it also says that we delight in the law of the Lord. The law. We usually probably don't associate the word delight and the word law together, typically, do we? When, as a matter of fact, when you hear the word law, we typically think of statutes and ordinances and things of that nature. You know, the Hebrew word that's typically translated law is the word Torah. And Torah is more than just a statute or an ordinance. Torah literally means instruction. It literally means, in fact, there's a verb form of that word, yara, and it does mean to instruct. The whole point is not a list of bare statutes and ordinances, but the whole point is instruction in order to uh, help us to transform and to grow. It's not just empty rules. It's God's instruction to us when we're talking about the Lord's Torah. And so we delight in His instruction, knowing, there, knowing that it's the Lord's instruction. What does it mean to delight in something? Oh, if you delight in something, you're going to enjoy it. You're going to relish it. You're going to savor it. You're going to cherish it. You're going to appreciate it. You know, the uh, psalmist says that God's Word is more desirable than gold and sweeter than honey. It's something to be desired. It's something to, uh, to savor. Kind of reminds me when you go out for a good steak dinner. I mean, when you walk into the place, or actually when you step out of the car, you can already smell the aromas coming from the place, right? Your stomach begins to rumble, and you really enjoy and savor and, and delight in that. And that's kind of what the psalm is saying. That's the way it is with the blessed man who delights in the law of the Lord. And he meditates on it day and night. In the Bible, when we're talking about meditation, we're not talking about emptying your mind of all things, but we're talking about filling your mind with the things of God. To meditate means to ponder. To meditate means to think about. To meditate means to reflect, to mull it over. You know, in the 119th Psalm, that's the longest chapter in the entire Bible, <clears throat> 119th Psalm is all about uh, the word of the Lord. And in the 97th verse, the psalmist says, Oh, how I love your law, your instruction. It is my meditation all the day. I'm always thinking about God and His instruction and His guidance to me. In the 148th verse, it says, My eyes anticipate the night watches. Have you ever pulled night duty before when it's just dead and there's nothing going on and there just seems like there's nothing to do and the night just drags on and on and on? Well, the psalmist says, My eyes anticipate the night watches. Why? That I might meditate on your word. Because it's precious to me. It's sweet to me. And when I meditate on God's word, when I learn to delight on God's word, then that becomes like irrigation for my soul. And as the psalmist says, A tree does not wither and it bears its fruit in season. A man once told me uh, one time that uh, he felt like he was spiritually starving. He says, you know, church doesn't do any good for me. I don't ever get anything out of it. And I uh, feel like I'm... And he was implying that he was spiritually starving. 
And uh, the reason because the uh, Bible classes weren't deep enough, the sermons weren't uh, good enough, and he wasn't getting anything out of it. And he said it almost kind of in an accusing sort of way. And I, we, we talked about it for a while, and I finally I had to ask. I said, well, how often do you read your Bible? How often do you read your Bible? Did, did the, is the only time you pick up your Bible and read it during the sermon or when you come to a Bible class? Because if that's true, then, of course, you're probably going to feel like you're spiritually starving. Um, we can't survive on nourishment only once, twice, or three, or even four times a week. We need it on a regular basis. And I know when it comes to this, if you don't get this after a while, it's going to affect you, right? And so we need to be irrigated and nourished constantly by the Word of God. Now, I know there was a time in my life that uh, I didn't drink a whole lot of this. And, uh, you know, uh, sometimes we, it's got to be tea, right? It's always got to be mixed with something. Some people love sodas, and they drink more soda than they do uh, water. And, you know, the only way to desire water is to do what? You've got to drink it, right? And then you wind up uh, acquiring a taste for it. And you know what? When you get cool, fresh, clean water, you get to the point where you realize there is nothing quite like it. Nothing quenches quite like uh, uh, pure, clean clean water. And that's kind of the way we need to be with God's Word. It's going to take more than a sip. It means I need to spend time with it. It means I need to meditate on God's Word. And maybe you already do this. I would suggest when you take time uh, in God's Word to take some time and, and savor it. If I, if I really find this sweet and I savor it, then I'm going to turn it around in my mind. I'm going to pray about it. I'm going to meditate. I'm going to think about it and even have a, a notebook over here where I'm going to write some of my reflections based on what I've read and maybe ask myself, what is it God is saying to me? If this is God's instruction to me and I've just read a good portion of God's Word, what is it that God is saying to me and write it and, write it and, uh, and meditate on it? And once you do that and get in the habit of do that, doing that, you get to the point where you just look forward to the next time you pick it up and start reading again. The psalmist said in uh, verse 82 in the 119th Psalm, My eyes fail with longing for your word. And when I get to that point, then the Bible, God's word, will become even more of a benefit. Let's go to the next one, Ephesians chapter 6. The Bible is like our water, our irrigation, but the Bible is also our sword. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 6, this is in that uh, armor of God section of Scripture. And in uh, verse 13, the passage says, Therefore put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, stand firm. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of of God. The passage says, take up the full armor of God. Every part of the armor is important. And you notice it equates, uh, equates the different pieces of armor with uh, righteousness and salvation and truth and, and, uh, and things of that nature. And you need to have all parts of the armor, but especially the sword. Imagine if you were to go into battle and you had all the armor on, but you didn't go into battle with the sword. Uh, you're not going to last very long, right? You might be able to, uh, to withstand for a little while, but you need to have the sword. It's the one piece of offensive equipment in all of this. And I happen to notice it's kind of interesting that out of all the things that are mentioned, it mentions a sword, but you notice there's no spear, no spear, no bow and arrow. What does that suggest about the nature of the battle? It's uh, up close and uh, personal. I remember a few years ago, uh, a couple of years ago, they opened up that uh, Clay Clayton Museum of Natural or Ancient History at York College. And I um, was going through the exhibits there, and they actually had uh, some pieces of uh, Roman military equipment, including what they called the gladius, the typical uh, Roman sword. And I was kind of uh, surprised. This was an actual uh, sword. Uh, of course, the uh, handles kind of rotted away, but the metal was still there. The blade was only that long, less than three feet long. 
not as impressive as some of those medieval knight swords that are really long, you know, with all the jewels and everything on it. Only, uh, only this long. And uh, it doesn't seem like it would be very effective, but it, is, it was very effective for up and close personal face-to-face -face combat. And uh, the Roman army was known as one of the most efficient armies in the world at the time. And I want to focus on that piece of equipment just for a moment. The sword. The sword. Take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now, if the sword is the Word of God, what does that say about the type of battle that we are engaged in? The sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. It means the battle is about words, right? It's about words. It's about truth versus lies. In fact, if you look at the context, it uh, describes the nature of our battle. Verse 10 of Ephesians 6 says, Be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil uh, in uh, the heavenly realms. Um, and so the nature of our battle is not against flesh and blood. It's not literal swords. It's not with uh, cannons and guns and fists and things of that nature. But it's against the devil's schemes. The Bible says that the devil is a schemer. The devil is a liar. That is, the, that is central to his nature. He is the ultimate con man. The devil more often uses lies and seduction to attack us than he does brute force. In fact, isn't that what he did at the very beginning when he attacked Eve? Oh, you shall surely not die if you eat that fruit that God told you not to eat. God knows that when you eat that fruit, you're, you'll be like God. You'll become wise. You'll know the difference between good and evil. And with that lie, he left Eve staring at that fruit as she's replaying the words that Satan told her in her mind. Those lies. And eventually she accepted the lie. And she ate and it destroyed that's the nature of the battle that we're involved in. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 says this, We do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not weapons of the world. Did you get that? The weapons we fight with are not weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. What strongholds are we talking about? It goes on and says, We demolish arguments. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. With the truth of God, we destroy false arguments and we take every thought captive to Christ. No wonder since the very beginning... The enemy has always wanted to destroy this book. No wonder since the very beginning the enemy has wanted to, um, wanted to uh, subdue Christian truth. You know, I keep hearing more and more uh, over the years how Christians will go to uh, various places and uh, academic institutions, universities, and there they're often ridiculed, harassed, and strong-armed, oftentimes by uh, Marxists or atheist professors. And I used to think that was kind of an overreaction, but the more people I talk to, the more I hear that this actually does happen. And there's all kinds of false ideas that are floating around in the air, and sometimes if we're not careful, we wind up accepting them and not even realizing we're accepting unbiblical ideas. For instance, the idea that man is inherently good, or the idea that there is no such thing as an absolute ethic or an absolute moral, or no such thing as heaven or hell, or the idea that the ultimate authority in life is government. Uh, used to be people used to ask the first question, is this ethical, is it right or wrong? But now the first question oftentimes is asked is, is it legal? And if it's legal, well, then that's the end of the question. But just because something is legal doesn't necessarily mean it's right or wrong or ethical. 
or this idea that man is only a biological organism, a product of random chance, and you are no different than the slug that's crawling outside there on the ground, and that in rejects the inherent dignity of life, or the idea that if, you, if you're going to have a religion, it doesn't matter what kind of religion you have, you know, or you can choose uh, all religions, and that's okay, or you can choose no religion at all, but you can't choose all religions. All religions cannot be true. Um, I believe a lot of these underlying ideas and philosophies are part of the foundation of the mess that we're in right now today in the world. Do you see why God's word is called the sword of the spirit? The only way to deal with false ideas is with truth. And the psalmist said in the 119th Psalm, verse 160, the sum of your word is true. The sum of your word, all of your word is is truth. And if God's word is truth, and if God is truth and the source of truth, and if God is the creator of all things, and that means there is a biblical foundation for every area of life. Think about that. A biblical foundation for every area of life. Whether we're talking about my finance, finances, whether we're talking about psychology, after all, God made the mind, right? Whether we're talking about sociology, sociology is all about relationships, right? And isn't God the author of relationships? Even is, Isn't God the creator of relationships? God is a relational God, so there's a biblical foundation there. Whatever, whatever it is, there is a biblical foundation for all areas of life, and the key is the more we spend time in God's Word, the more we think biblically about life and the world around us, and then we can navigate successfully through life in a godly way. That brings us to the next point. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. God's word is a scalpel. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. It says that the word of God is alive and active sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of Him to whom we must give account. Now I know the text doesn't specifically use the word scalpel, but I think the idea can be there. I, you know, I used to think this, this verse said uh, you know, that the, the Bible is like a sword, but it says it's sharper. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. Um, it can expose what's going on inside of you. It's not a sword, but it's more like a precision instrument. You can uh, take a scalpel and you can open somebody up and you can tell a lot about In fact, you don't need to open somebody up anymore. Do, you know, they got those little... Uh, what do you call those little cameras on the end of the little tubes, the lights on them? You can uh, make a little incision and you can thread it in and you can look inside of our bodies without actually opening ourselves up. And when you look inside of somebody, you can actually tell a lot about them, can't you? Was this person, did this person have a healthy lifestyle? Uh, was this person a smoker or a non smoker? Uh, did this person eat right? Did he have a high fat diet? Uh, did he exercise? Was he a drinker? There's a lot you can tell when you take a little scalpel and you look inside of somebody. How many of you go in to get medical tests every now and then? I just had one done last week. Uh, we go in sometimes for a blood test or A1C or our, uh, annual physical, and, uh, and there's all kinds of different tests. And I don't know if you're like me. Some, do you ever dread going in for those tests? Um, I don't particularly enjoy them because I think, you know, you know they're probably going to tell me that things aren't very good. And there's a reason why things aren't very good because probably I haven't been living the way I'm supposed to and, and haven't been living as healthy as I've, I'm supposed to. Uh, but they tell you that if, uh, you know, this is what's going on and uh, you need to make changes in your life, otherwise this is going to get worse. And they can tell that by looking inside of my body. But you know what you can't tell? from those tests, you can't tell whether someone's compassionate. You can't tell looking at a blood test whether somebody's a trustworthy person. You can't tell looking at an MRI whether somebody is an honest person or a selfish person or a generous person or reasonable 
or godly or wise or any of these other more significant things because that type of instrument just doesn't go deep enough. But this passage says God's Word does. God's Word is like an MRI for the soul. And that's the most important test that we can take. So how do I allow God's instrument to do its work? Well, I need to expose my mind and my heart to it. I need to read it regularly. And my focus needs to be not just on examining the Word of God, but my focus also needs to be on allowing the Word of God to examine me. That's really what this is saying here. And then the next question is, what do I do with it? What do I do with what I see? Brings us to the last point. Um, God's Word is a mirror. James chapter 1. James chapter 1 and verse 22 says this. Do not merely listen to the Word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the Word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. You see the analogy here, God's Word being like a mirror? Probably, all, probably every single one of us, I am sure, has a mirror in your house. Probably every single one of us has a mirror either on our dresser or especially in, uh, above the uh, bathroom sink. Why do you have a mirror there? Well, that mirror is so that you can see yourself for the purpose of looking yourself over and to straighten yourself out and to make corrections. And he said, that's the way the Word of God is. It shows us what we need to correct in our lives. Bob Goff once said that he thought that the term Bible study was kind of strange. Bible study. You know, Christians are always talking about Bible study. And he said the reason he thought it was kind of strange because I thought we were supposed to do it, not study it. thought we were supposed to take it and put it into action, not just study it. I mean, think about it. What if I were to get my... Uh, annual, uh, my uh, regular blood test from my doctor, and they gave me the printout. It had all the numbers on there. And I were to look at it, and I were to study it. And I memorized it. I knew all the numbers there. And if you were to ask me any, uh, any of the uh, test results on there, I could quote everything on that page to you. What good would it do if I were to learn it and to study it and to memorize it, but not do anything about it? Maybe this uh, modern day uh, parable will kind of make that point vividly here. What's the deal? What? I told you three days ago to clean your room. I know. Well, I'm glad you know. It's a mess. I memorized what you said. What do you mean you memorized what I said? Every word. Wait, you memorized that I told you to clean your room? Yes. And I learned how to say it in Spanish and in Hebrew. And if you want to know how to say it in Spanish, it's Yo Limpio El Dormitorio. That's, that's what, that's Spanish. 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 Okay. And I um, read a book. It's called Five Ways to Clean Your Room. It just really helped me to understand, like, what you said. And it was really, like, it was awesome. And I had friends from my small group over. It was so good. We talked about, like, the importance of a clean room and, like, what it's like to have a clean room and, like, how you should have a clean room. It was so so good. It was absolutely incredible. And Susie came over, you remember? Yeah. She came over and we like mapped it out on a sheet of paper on what my room would have been like 
if I when I did clean it, and it looked really good. Like it, everything was really precise. Uh, okay, well, uh, keep up the keep up the good work. Thanks. I love you. He's holding me accountable. Yeah. All right. Hopefully, that's not the way we approach uh, God's word. It's a mirror, and it's uh, designed for uh, to guide us and bless us when we take what we see and we put it into action. I don't want to just study God's Word, but I want to let God's Word study me and to mold me into becoming a more godly husband, father, an employee, neighbor, friend, a follower of Christ. And so this is how I can make the most of my Bible. It's God's instruction to us. And based on all of this, I want to uh, leave you with five, uh, with four final uh, suggestions. I'm going to switch metaphors here. We talked, I think Larry talked about the bread of life. You know, that's the word of God. It's what sustains us. And so I'm using a food metaphor. Let me suggest these uh, steps on making the most of your Bible. Number one, don't rely solely on pre-chewed pre-digested food. All right. What I'm talking about are my sermons. What I'm talking about are our Bible classes. And you, under, you understand what I mean by pre-digested food? I mean, this is the result of someone else who has taken the time and read, the, read God's Word and has distilled it down and digested it, and here we have and Here we have it, okay? We need to spend time on our own reading God's Word as well. So don't rely just on pre-chewed, pre-digested foods. Uh, eat regularly. Uh, I know some of us are taking the time to, to try to read the, the Bible through again. Uh, but whatever you do, read portions of the Bible on a regular basis. Uh, that's the only way you can truly uh, have a lasting benefit from it. Um, chew it fully and uh, digest it. What I'm talking about here is uh, don't just read it to read it, but read it to savor it. Read it to reflect on it. And uh, if you don't already do something like this, as I find it a helpful uh, exercise, that I keep a notebook over here, and uh, when I read, whatever insights I have, whatever thoughts, or sometimes my prayers, whatever, I write it down. And uh, I often ask the question, uh, what is God telling me in this reading? If this is the Word of God, if this is God's message to me, what do I learn about God? What do I learn about myself? Uh, what insights do I have? And then uh, pray and write down some specific action steps to take and to come back to based on what you've read. And then finally, don't eat alone. Don't eat alone. The reason why we have uh, classes and Bible study groups, the reason why we have one another, uh, take the time to be able to read alongside with uh, other Christians and to uh, encourage each other. There's nothing like the... Uh, uh, encouragement and the support and the perspective we receive by uh, going through God's Word alongside somebody else. So this is how we can make the most of our Bible. We're going to go ahead and sing a song this morning and offer our uh, traditional uh, uh, invitation. And I want you to think about this as we uh, sing this morning. And, um, and I want to challenge you, if you haven't already started, if you're not already doing this, to take this book and read it uh, every day.